Well, hi, everybody. And as you can tell, it's a little bit different today. Uh, you're getting two preachers for the price of one. Um, and um, actually, you can probably tell you're getting, well, not just two, but because we've got Jerome and me, you can tell it's kind of two and a half for the price of one. It's about right, isn't it? So, um, so we're trying something a little bit different. We're going to tag preach this, never done this before. Uh, so we hope that you don't just catch the novelty of it, but you catch the heart of what we are trying to communicate uh, in our message today. You'll know that over these last few weeks, we've been doing this series called Reframing and really challenging some perceptions, the way we think about uh, certain things. And today, we want to put a little sort of subtitle underneath that, uh, which you'll see on the screen, which says Lean Church or Lazy Church. I really want to talk about that uh, at the moment because we're in this scenario of lockdown. People are already beginning to ask, when are we going to get back to church? When can we come back together? And the thing that seems to be sat underneath as a subtext of that, certainly amongst a lot of leaders, is, is church going to be the same again? Um, Are we going to be doing things the way we used to do? Are we just going to get back to what we knew as normal? When in fact, the narrative seems to be that there's going to be a new normal. We need to engage with that process in some thought-through way so we understand what church looks like. Do you know, lazy church is, we'll just carry on and give no thought for where we're going. But the the Bible talks about uh, part of David's mighty men that he selected a small group of guys that were known as the men of Issachar. And the Bible says because they understood the signs of the times and how to interpret them. And I very much believe, we believe, and as a leadership in our church believe that actually this is just a virus that's hit the world, it's hit the world, but, but, but in it, God is at work. I'm not saying God has sent the virus, but in this season, God is not out of control, he is at work, and he wants us to understand what he's, what he's doing and how to interpret the signs. That's lean church thinking, not lazy church thinking. So you may have seen, we've got kind of an illustration here. I'm going to, I want to get Jerome to explain why our Christmas presents have arrived a bit early. So I think pre-lockdown, this is a, this table kind of illustrates uh, maybe your life, maybe my life, uh, maybe also the, the life of the church. It was it was packed, okay? It was packed to the, to the brim. It, it, uh, let's call this table the table of busyness. This, is, this has probably often been our lives. And then COVID hit and, and lockdown hit, and it was almost like, it was almost like God kind of just said, <laughs> wow. <laughs> just everything that you were concerned with, everything that was was on the table of business, God just decided to just knock it off and say, I want you now, as you step out of lockdown, to reframe. I want you to reframe and rethink how you're going to live your life. And I guess this is a picture, not necessarily saying that some of the stuff that we did before wasn't needed, but for that time, it was right. And for this time, something different is needed. As Nick said, Lean Church is about adapting and looking at the times and how we can be most effective in those times. Lazy Church thinking is just simply, let's do the same old, same old. But God has given us an opportunity and he has wiped the the table clean and says, I want you to reframe your thinking. Nick is going to read a, a really interesting passage from 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10, and and it really kind of is the hook. That's where we're going to hook a lot of our thinking onto as we go further in our preach today. So this is Paul writing the letter, and he says these words, because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder, and now others are building on it. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have. That is Jesus Christ. And anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work or quality of service each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. 
If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss and the builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. I just want to just highlight what that verse is saying there. Firstly, it's not written to non-Christians, it's written to the church. Mm. So this is for us, it's relevant for us. And what Paul is really saying is, you can live your life in such a way that it promotes an investment, not just for the future as a legacy, but for the kingdom. Yeah. Or you can live a life that kind of short circuits the mean, just living in the me now environment. Mm. I'm looking after me. That's what Paul is saying. You can build a life with, with the cheap stuff with wood, hay, and straw, but when the fire comes, and it, when the day of the Lord comes, what's gonna be left? What's gonna remain? We wanna make sure, we wanna challenge ourselves, our congregation, people that call themselves Christians to say, just what kind of life are we building for the future? Are we just gonna sit back and just be a little bit lazy in our thinking, or are we gonna use this season that we find ourselves in to say, God, what is it you are directing my life towards. I want to be a lean, understanding thinker with my faith so that you can use me for uh, the kingdom to come. Now we're going to really camp ourselves off of that verse in the New Testament church as, as is outlined in Acts. And there are some really just one-liner accounts that we are kind of sort of go backwards and forwards with there, just to give you an example of how the early church had to innovate. You remember that when the church was born, actually originally it was seen as part of Judaism. It was seen as a sect within Judaism. The people became known as the people of the way. Um, but there was this increasing tension that emerged in church between the law of Judaism and the gospel of grace that was emerging under that new covenant that Jesus brought us. Eventually that, that came to a head at a big council in Jerusalem and Christianity as a faith was really born at that point. But you'll notice that believers, they could not afford to just harp back to the way things were done. Yeah. So there's a, there's a whole list of stuff that we, we could go through there. You can talk about so in, one for us. In Acts 3, Jimmy, we've got them at the, the gate beautiful and there's an issue there. And, and really what they could have done is they could have looked at the problem and thought, well, we, we don't have any anything to solve it. We don't have any uh, uh, way to, to stop what is happening. But often in the book of Acts, we see that when they came up against problems, they innovated. Yeah. Every time they came up against a problem, they innovated their thinking. And they said, well, we don't have silver, we don't have gold, but this is what we can give you. It's an it's a, uh, example of innovation. Another one in Acts chapter 7. You'll have heard that if you're listening to Pastor Clement a few weeks ago. The problem of feeding food to the Hellenistic Jews and the distribution was going out. It seemed to be in uneven ways. That could have been something that could have undermined the diversity of the church at that time. But some wisdom came. They, they leaned on the power of the Holy Spirit and they innovated and solved a problem as a church in that situation. Acts chapter 8, when Paul, where Saul is persecuting the church and we're told that actually in Acts chapter 8 verse 4, it, said, it says that they scatter and preach the word of God where they are. They came up against a problem and they innovated. They had lean mentality to think we're going to read our times and how can we innovate in this time? Acts chapter 16, the first start of that chapter, you read the encounter where Paul is busy on his missionary journeys, planting churches throughout Asia Minor, and then he is frustrated about getting into certain regions, doesn't know, he's made plans, can't find a way forward, he doesn't throw in the towel, actually together with the power of God a dream comes, and something massively innovative is born through this dream, if you read that carefully, he has a dream about a man in Macedonia, which is set in Europe, and he realizes, do you know what? I need to take this message of the gospel of grace. I'm going to innovate outside of my comfort zone of my own Asia minor continent. I'm going to set sail and come across to Europe. And of course, the church, he lands at Philippi and the church in Europe is birthed. And of course, the rest is history at that point. See, church, what we see here is every single time the early church came up against a problem, they innovated. 
They couldn't have a lazy church mentality, which is simply perpetuating the same old, same old. But they had to have a lean church mentality, which responds to God and the needs of the people. Remember that these were still Jewish people. Um, we're talking about Jews, and yet there had to be this shift in thinking as they, as, they, uh, as they partnered with the Holy Spirit and were passionate about getting the gospel of grace out there. So that was a real challenge for many of them, they had to navigate these waters um, really carefully. But such was the shift that actually out of that, uh, the church began to have an incredible influence under the power of God throughout the world at that point. I just wonder whether we're seeing ourselves in a similar scenario in our world right now. I'm going to ask Jerome just to pick up with the, with the first point then, just to sort of nail this. So there, there, there are three things that we want to leave with you, church, today that, that really point towards a lean church mentality and move away from a potential lazy church mentality. And the first thing is this, it's priests and kings, not priests, then kings. Priests and kings, not priests, then good. kings. Let, let, let me just explain that a little bit. It, in Israel's history, there, there were three main uh, rulers in, in terms of how they were governed. Uh, priests, kings, and prophets. And the priest often, he uh, would represent the people to God. Uh, the prophet would often speak God's word to the king and the people as well. And the king would be the one who would have influence, wider influence in the social context driven by godly principles. So priests represent people to God. Uh, prophet, if you want to summarize it, God to people. And the king represented uh, the godly principles and influencing wider society. Mm -hmm. And I think really what's happened in, our, in, in church over the last uh, 25 years is that there has been a real promotion of the priest ministry. And what do I mean by that? When we use the word priest, we can almost replace it with the word pastor. And in the church, people have felt, they have felt like, I'm only really doing ministry if I'm a pastor or if I'm a worship leader. And the problem with that, and when we were planning this, Nick, he had this amazing tweetable quote. And what he said is this, he said, for many of us, and I believe this is going to set some people free, actually, because you, you've been frustrated. And many of you, you've been frustrated with your kingly mandate because you only thought a priestly call was on offer. What do I mean by that? I mean, you're trying to shoebox yourself into a pastor, worship leader kind of uh, mold, not realizing that there is a kingly, wider social context ministry that God has for you. And that is lean church mentality saying, no, 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 we need priests and kings. Yeah, we need ordained, called people, men and women of God to equip the saints, priests, pastors. We need those people, but we also need kings and queens to step out into society and have an effect on different areas of society driven by their godly principles. Yeah. It is priests and kings, not priests, then kings. And so that, that's the first thing that for us as a church, we want to change our mentality to say, God, we understand the role of, of pastors. We understand uh, the importance of them. But equally as important is we need kings and queens to influence wider society who are driven by godly principles. Nick, do you want to just talk about the second one? Uh, I will. I just want to come off the back of that. Sorry. And I know we didn't rehearse this, but as, as Jerome is speaking there, I actually feel that that is a release for some people that are watching this. And, and some of you actually just hearing that statement uh, empowers you to be all that God has called you to be in the avenue of work that he's set you, the network that he's placed you amongst. And actually, you're not to see that as some kind of also ran addition to your life. It's your sweet spot that brings ministry and the kingdom of God where God has set you. Yeah. So, I mean, if that's you and you want to you say something in the chat, we'd, we'd love to see that come back. But at the very least, bring that before God and say, Lord, release me in that area of influence in, in this society. Some of you, you carry immense skill, yeah. immense wisdom, immense education, 
And you don't need that squeezed into how we do life on a Sunday. You need to be all that God has called you to be Monday through Saturday and find the release. So if that helps you, the Lord bless you in that. Yeah, so the second point, because I know we're on a time frame here. You've got two preachers and how are we going to get our stuff into half an hour? That's, that's going to be a miracle right there. The second point we just want to leave with you is religion versus authenticity. Religion versus authenticity. Jesus is approached one day uh, by a guy who, who asks what seems to be an innocent question, but it's a testing question. Um, and he's asking about how he can in- inherit eternal life and um, ha- how he's meant to sort of uh, utilize his resources best for the kingdom. And Jesus tells a parable. He tells the parable of the talents, if you remember. Um, you're, that's quite a sort of well sort of trodden verse, really. Yeah. Um, and he says he gives five talents or ten talents, depending on which version you're reading, uh, to one guy, and then two talents or five talents to the second guy. And he's, Jesus uses these words of those two guys. He says, those went out. I want you to remember that phrase. And then the, the third one, he gives one talent, and it says that one went away. It's a very deliberate choice of words. The two went out because they weren't lazy, they were lean. They went out to do something with what the master had given them. The lazy thinker, and Jesus calls him lazy, by the way, if you look at the end of that parable, says, I'm just going to consolidate what I've been given. I'm going to keep it the same. What does he do? He buries it in the ground, thinking, if I can just protect what I have and have no movement with it, I'll be rewarded for that. And of course, the opposite is true. Jesus is teaching a really important point. Some of you may have heard of of something called the Qumran community. The Qumran community is actually where we got, or we we, we rediscovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, which really validated and endorsed a lot of the the Old and New Testament writings that we have in the Bible today. Just incredible archaeological discovery. But if you follow the story of the Qumran community, you'll see that they actually did something very similar to what was said in the parable. They were a group of very religious, very spiritual, very devoted followers of the way, the followers of Christ. They preserved a lot of the writings that became scripture. But instead of engaging with society, they sought to literally bury themselves away in Qumran. They literally lived in caves and they would bury the scriptures for safekeeping, which weren't discovered then for another 2,000 years years just buried away you see lazy thinking when it comes to call says well we'll just stay here yeah and god is saying i want you to look at the signs of the time and move over there i wonder if anybody can ever remember what a library is you know that place where they used to have books anybody remember books (laughs) remember that and um libraries have books that are ordered and actually there's a system that those that 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 kind of orders those books it's an internationally recognized system called the dewey decimal system i've come across people that that um that they're really inspired by the the um the filing system called the dewey decimal system but the deal with a library is not that books are all neatly filed on a shelf in order of course it's right that we'd be able to find them but a good library has books that are used a lot. Mm-hmm. A good library that is used a lot means that a community, it becomes literary in its thinking, is able to think through scenarios and engage in conversation, and people are educated. Yeah. Folks, it doesn't matter if those books get used up. The knowledge that is transmitted can change a community. And all of us, if I can, if I can say, as people of God... We're meant to be like books, not filed on a shelf, doing the right thing on the right day of the week and saying we've ticked that box, but actually to risk something with our lives and become used up. Sure, we may make mistakes and fail. That's a bit like a book getting worn or or torn on a corner, but God has said, I've called you to live an abundant life, not for your benefit, but for my benefit, God says, so that the kingdom of God is expressed and the gospel, the good news of grace, touches a whole community. What are you going to do? You're going to think religion or you're going to think about authenticity when it comes to your faith and begin to share that. Last one, Joanna. And I just want to pick up on one of those things. Like maybe the first week of uh, 
of online church was a novelty. Yeah. It was a novelty. It was, oh, this is nice. This is... And over the weeks, um, your intentionality of your engagement, when it is worship, when it's the word, uh, when it's other things, um, has, has waned a bit, really. Uh, and I think really this whole thing of authenticity is, uh, and in our time, I mean, maybe a couple months ago, we could give you a call, say, hey, I ain't seen you at church for a couple mm -hmm. weeks, how you doing and whatnot. Right. But now no one knows. Sure. No one knows whether you're here. No one knows if you're tuning in. Uh, no one knows how real you are in your faith. And what I love about it, and I was speaking to one of my friends the other day, what he said is, is lockdown has, it's almost been that torch on people's lives where they are finding out what they are really about. Yeah, come on. Lazy thinking stays in religion. Yeah. Religion doesn't do anything. Religion is dead, okay? It doesn't, it doesn't offer any life. It doesn't offer any hope. But authentic relationship with Jesus is what he offers us and what we have to offer the world. And that starts in your own home. That starts where you are. That starts with your own heart and you being real with who you are before God and engaging with, with the community of believers, not in a religious way, because now, I mean, maybe what was before, we did it out of religion because we would get caught out. Yeah, yeah. You, you yeah. mean, we could, we, yeah. we could catch you out. Whereas now, no one's going to catch you out. So are you doing this stuff because this is what you truly believe? Or is it still stuck in that sense of religion? Last point, we don't want to spend too long, but the last point is this, is a gathered to scatter. The early church, they had this mentality of a gather to scatter. Remember I talked about in Acts chapter 8 when they were being persecuted, we're told that they scatter to preach the gospel. And just to keep that in your head, to me when I was thinking about it, it was this gather to scatter. Gather to scatter. Gather to scatter. Gather to scatter. I know you're dancing. Gather to scatter. Gather. I'm a drummer, so it's straight away I was just gather to scatter. Gather. Let me tell you what gather is. Gather is, is a place to be fueled and to be catapulted. Yeah. What we have done so often through church history is we have majored on the gather. It's all about the gathering, getting bums on seats, getting people in the building. And the gather was always there to fuel us and to catapult us so that we would scatter. And what scatter is about is, is action and impact. Action and impact. So what we want to have is a lean church mentality, which is a gather to scatter. Gather to scatter. Gather to scatter. Come on. Gather to scatter. I know you're dancing. Gather to scatter. That's what we want because the impact is seen in the scatter, but the fueling is seen in the gather. And the early church, they often understood that, that actually we are only as strong as when we come together and as when we're separate. It, there's no either or. There's no like, okay, we just, we, we just want to be together, be together in this nice religious club. The world right now doesn't need a religious club. It needs an organism that is alive, filled with the Holy Spirit, reading the times, yeah. and trying to respond to God and delivering what the word of God into people's lives. We have, we've, we're really trying to move away from this lazy church mentality that perpetuates the same old, same old, but actually a lean mentality that responds to God and the needs of the people. So we're going to kind of close our message today, but there are some anchors. There are some real life things that actually as a church during lockdown, we have been doing, which is really shaping our thinking to being a more lean church rather than lazy church. I just want to read before we come into that, something that will set the context for that. And uh, it's some words from Isaiah chapter 58. Some of you will know that. Um, and it's where God is handling the religiosity of his people. Yeah. And people were there, were fasting, and they were saying, why doesn't God listen to us? And uh, he really comes back very strong to say, actually, it's not, that, it's not your fasting that I want. I know some of us may feel very liberated by that. Actually, that's not the kind of fasting that I want. 
he, say, he says these words, this is the kind of fasting I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free. Remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry. Give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them and don't hide from relatives who need your help. And here's the promise, church. Then your salvation will come like the dawn and your wounds will quickly heal. And your godliness, because that's what it looks like, yeah. will lead you forward and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. Yes, I am here. He will quickly reply. We'd just like to share with you some of the things. We, we've not been still as a leadership, as an engagement of people in the church. I know for many of you, it's been so frustrating. We can't gather, you can't see, and we're just doing our best to try to connect through whatever means that we can. And I hope you can avail yourself as much of those as possible. We've endeavored to put some things in place that really draw us to the commission of the church, of the people of God. And maybe that's why God swept some stuff off the table. Not that it was bad, but actually if it occludes the heart of God, then maybe it is bad. We can be busy and forget the call of God. We can fast religiously and forget his heart and compassion for people. And so over these last few uh, weeks and months, we have sought to engage well. Some of you, if not many of you, would have received the pastoral phone calls just trying to touch base and make sure people are well and doing all right. We've committed ourselves to that as a team to try and make sure people have a sense of being watched and cared for. But beyond that, there's some other exciting things that, are, that we've done. So you'll know that uh, we run a program called Life Bread. And just recently, we've asked June Blake to take on the leadership of that project. And she is so excited about that and cannot wait. You know, because of social distancing, we've not been able to have people to come in and to feed them a meal. We're just not allowed to do that. But she's thought through innovatively because that's the word, you see. Well, just because we're shut down doesn't mean to say we can't fulfill the commission in feeding the hungry. And so she's looked for ways with some of her volunteers to open up the building and do a takeaway service that'll be managed carefully. We need volunteers to help, so think about that, because she's already said to me, I need some help with that. But that is, we're imminently about to have a kind of a takeaway service to feed the hungry people that are, are, are are struggling with, with poverty and places to live and, and, and where to feed themselves. And alongside that, something has kind of uh, emerged really. Some of you will remember Helping Hands, and then some will remember that we took an offering up at the end of last year. I'm amazed at how God goes yeah. before us. God saw all this coming before we ever knew, and he's put some things in place. That's a whole other preach right there. But uh, you remember the H Fund, because we collected so much money from you that we had more than enough money to buy food with for the Christmas hampers that we did. So we set that money aside into a special fund. And now what we found is that actually there is a real need. There are people connected to our congregation um, that are just desperate. They don't have the money to even feed themselves. And so Andy and Margaret Arthur, together with a little team, um, they've come together. They have packed bags. We are probably sending 20 yeah. Uh, units, and I want to say units, that 20 sort of uh, groups of bags, and it's three bags a unit that they do to help people with their shopping as we get to hear about, just to minister and feed hungry people. And some of the responses have been absolutely tear-jerking. Uh, some of you will know what I'm talking about in how God has provided at just the right time and used this ministry to do that. And we have to understand that we're... Remember, we're, we're responding to God and the needs of people. I, I just want to paint the landscape for, for what's happening right now in, in our world. People are on the furlough uh, scheme. You might be on the furlough scheme and it's really about a retention for staff members, but October, that ends. And really, as a leadership team, we have been thinking about this and really been thinking about the fact that when that happens, for some people, they won't go back to their jobs. Yeah. And so where is it that we can support those people? That's a need. That, that's not just 
reacting, that's seeing what is coming. And, yeah. and as a church, that's how we should be, seeing what is coming through the eyes of faith and saying, how can we respond to the needs of the people in our community, but also uh, further afield? Mm -hmm. And so th there's that. Let me paint that picture for you. And then also, you... you you might have experienced loss yourself. There might have been people in your family uh, that has experienced loss. And there is a massive sense of grief that is overcoming our nation. Yeah. Where people are either grieving the people that they've lost yeah. or grieving a loss of the way life used to be. Yeah. But either way you look at that, there is a sense of grief that is heavy in the heart of people. And so that's there also in, in, in the, the, the picture. Then we have relationships. Yeah. People have been in lockdown and relationships and marriages and families have been strained. Yeah. And so that's a part of the picture as well. And then there has just been this, uh, this prohibitation of meeting together. And there, and how do we reach more people? And church has had to pivot and make a decision to yeah. go online and see how we can reach as many people. So can you begin to see the picture that is that, that as a leadership team, as a church that we are seeing and saying, how do we respond to that? And Life Bread and Love Mercy and, and all of the, the ways that they, we have been supporting people is a response to the picture that we're seeing. Yeah. We're, we're actually gonna launch our, our officially our social media department, which will be headed up by Lizette James. And we are so excited yeah. about that. She has got a whole scheme ready for us to go forward. But really the whole desire of that is to is further progress the kingdom of God and our reach to people. That, that's what we want. We want to reach as many people as possible. And whereas maybe before social media or online presence was something of an add-on, we're realizing that actually it's something much more integral to the way forward of a lean church thinking mentality. Third thing as well is, uh, is our life, life connect. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I had this picture uh, painted for me. You know the Titanic, uh, when it was sinking, uh, the reason why there were a lot of deaths is because there weren't a lot of lifeboats. And it was the amount of lifeboats was the reason why so many people drowned. If there were more lifeboats, if there were more uh, boats for people to get into, they would get to safety. You know the, the film of Titanic, do you know what I mean? You kind of feel like Kate Winslet was a bit selfish with that door, but hey, we won't go into that. We'll just, she could have let Le, uh, Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio get onto that, I'm just saying. But, but, but what I'm saying is that the lifeboats were there to keep people alive. Let's be real. The last three months, your life connect, it probably feels like a lifeboat. It probably feels actually, this has been a way that I can connect with people, fellowship with people. And some of you that are not in Life Connect, you don't know. My mum used to say to me, you don't know what you need until you've got it. And the moment you have got a Life Connect, that's when you're like, ah, I always needed this. And so we are really promoting our life connects to a place of being integral in the going forward of our church. We want every single person to be in a life connect. Yeah. We want every single person that, that sees themselves a part of this community to be in a life connect group. And then social justice. You've seen what has happened over the last few months. And really the church is the church's responsibility to speak into that. And so we're going to be creating a forum for us as a, as a wider church. The last, uh, a, a few weeks ago, we had those, that three-part series called At the Table, talking about racial injustice. And please don't ever think that that was just because it was nice to do that at the time. This is big on our hearts of how do big we time. fight as a church racial injustice and see racial reconciliation, not only just in the church, but wider afield. And so we want to create a, a forum where actually we can begin to think strategically about how we do that as a church. And those details will be coming out soon. And the last one is our hope, grief, support. Remember the picture I painted of, of grief and the loss that people are feeling. We want to create support groups, spaces, and that's already been running that run last year. Bob and Margaret run, ran that. And we want to create those spaces for people where they can process their grief 
and that they can be in a safe environment mm -hmm. and hear the hope of God spoken into their situation. Church, we are not trying to be lazy, perpetuating the same old, same old. And let me tell you, online church is a part of lean church thinking. It is. We are doing online church. We are doing everything that we are doing simply because we want to see the kingdom of God progress as far as possible in this time. So you see this empty table and the things that we were doing and we just felt like COVID has kind of wiped a lot of that stuff that we were doing clear. There's some things we're putting back on the table. Let me just reach across you to help me here. We mentioned these things. As you can see, when you put some things back on the table, you can't always put back the other stuff on the table. So that's our social media. I'm putting that right there right now. And just speaking into issues means that we need some glasses to see a little bit of wisdom, a bit of focus down the line. A box of tissues would represent our grief support and uh, our online church. Well, we're all on the table at that point because we're all watching this together right now. And we want to pack this table correctly. I'm not saying that we're wiping the slate from everything. We're not saying that. We're looking actively at ways of how we're able to gather together again. Please hear us correctly. But we want to make sure that we're acting with wisdom, not just being lazy in our thinking, lean in our thinking, asking God to lead as well, because I actually think God is up to something. Yeah. And I think he's drawing his church back to the heart of the Great Commission which is to go into all the world, make disciples of all nation, nations, and to teach them more about the covenant of love and grace. So here's the challenge. You can, you can just say, well, it's all right. I'm just going to get back to normal. What's, what, what, is, what is normal? I think if we have a heart attitude that, that just doesn't think, stuff will happen. Our church is moving on because it's not our church. It's God's church. We get to steward it for a season and we're part of it for a generation. It's his church all the time. If we have a lazy mentality, we'll find ourselves moving to the peripheries of all the activity and just become bystanders. But if you can make a commitment in your heart, says, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning my thinking because I want to understand what God is doing in me, in my church, for our community. Lean thinking puts us in the heart of the plans and the purpose of God as it's being expressed through Emmanuel Gateway Church. We want you to be on board. Actually, if you want to be a part of that, we could have given email addresses for all of those departments. Maybe the easiest thing is just to stick your name in an email, info at epchurchaog.com. Info at epchurchaog.com, your email address, and then just say, I'd really like to be involved with this and we'll look to place you. If that means being a part of a Life Connect group, if that means being uh, helped with Life uh, life Bread, it means you wanna help with the grief support or some of the other groups. Um, if you wanna get into any of these areas, why don't you just say, I'm signing up for that and letting myself be a part of all the future. Maybe you just wanna be able to fund and finance some of these things. And we're, we're putting a lot of our financial resource by a lot of these things. We need financial backing for that. Without that, some of these things can't happen in the way that we'd want to have them. And we need you to buy into that too. So can we bring that as a challenge? Can we just speak to you? And actually, maybe we could just pray together as we bring a conclusion. And in this moment, I'm going to ask God by his Holy Spirit, him to touch your heart and to direct you right now. Can we pray together? Come on, let's just bow our heads, close our eyes for a moment. And before I say a thing, I'm just going to allow there to be a little bit of silence on camera so that God speaks to your heart in this moment. Let's pray. Father, I just believe you're talking to people. You're just revealing your heart to people. You're energizing. You're accessing their, their heart's desires and helping them understand that that's the call in your heart for them. And I pray, Father, that you would release people into great acts of service for the kingdom. Lord, I pray you'd speak prophetically and powerfully. I pray over our congregation that you would galvanize us for our future. Lord, we're not here to build just monuments to the past. Yeah. We want to be a movement that moves into the future, that yeah. glorious future 
that you have for us. I believe, oh God, that you've called us as Emmanuel to go from strength to strength. And I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would energize us as leaders, us as a community, people that are joining us even through this service today, that, Lord God, we can make the name of our God famous in our town, yes, in our city, yes. in the world that we're able to touch, I pray. Yes. I ask, set your call upon every individual that responds to you and may be lean for the kingdom of God, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So there's just uh, one thing left to say. I'm going to say, I better get this right. It's a good night from him. It's a good night from me. And ciao. What a sensational word that we have heard this morning. Once again, we find ourselves encouraged and challenged. So church, if you are not part of a Life Connect group, we encourage you to get involved, to get plugged in. Um, the details will come up on the screen and you should email lifeconnect at epchurchaog.com and they will get back in contact with you as soon as possible. Also, immediately after this service, we will be having Cafe Church by our leaders, Nick and Debbie. The details will also appear on the screen. Well, that's it from me, church. We will see you again next week, same time, same place. Thanks, church. Stay blessed. Ciao.